different today. I'm going to say, Jesus Christ is risen, and you'll respond by saying, he is risen indeed. So let's try that. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's do that again. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And one more time. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Yes, we acknowledge that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. We not only celebrate an empty cross, but an empty tomb. So with that being said, I want to invite all of you to stand up as we hear a reading from Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for this generation, who considered that he was cut off cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for our guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord.
to bring. Then I knew this song will sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Redeemer Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are here with us this Easter Sunday. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you yet, my name is Chris, and I am the lead pastor here at Redeemer. We want to extend a special welcome to all of you that are our guests. We want to invite you before you leave to pick up a gift bag that we have for you on the back table. It's got some goodies in it, and it's got a brief explanation of what our church is about. And we want to just briefly tell you what our church is about. We believe that the good news of Jesus Christ draws God's people together into a community. And we are built around that idea that when we encounter Jesus, we're united with God into a family. And together, we as a family of God worship him. And then we go and we tell other people about him. We proclaim good news. And then we take all 
that we have been given by God and we steward it for his glory while we make disciples of one another and serve our community. And so those are our core values. That's what we believe God has called us to do together as a church family. And so we encourage you, if you don't have a church home, a church family, consider joining this church family because we love to add people to what God is doing here in our church. Now, you can help us out if you are our guest here by taking the time to fill out one of these connection cards. And if you're a regular member or attender, you can fill one out as well. On the back, it's got a space for a prayer request. We promise not to spam you uh, with email or to send you a bunch of junk mail. We just would like to get to know you a little bit better and have a record of your visit here with us. You drop that in that offering box at the back. Let that be your offering to us today. We have a couple of announcements for our church family. One of the announcements is that we don't have our small groups. We meet in small groups uh, regularly, but not tonight and not next week. Not tonight because today is Easter. We want to encourage you to go be with your families and your friends today, and not next week because after church, Next week, we have a church family business meeting like we do every four months here, or every three months here, I should say. And so we want to invite you to plan to stay as a church family. We'll have lunch together. It's free. And then you can uh, join us for our church family business meeting. And we won't have small groups, but they will be back the first weekend in May. So those are some of our encouragements to us. Oh, one more thing. We want to encourage you to be inviting people to come and join us because next week we're kicking off our new sermon series called Get Wise, a study of the book of James. And there are some invitation cards on the back table back there. Uh, you can pick those up, hand those out to your friends, invite people to come and be part of our spring message series as we study how James brings us to an understanding of how the good news of Jesus leads us to live lives that are truly wise. Now, J uh, Jason had you practice this earlier. We're going to do this one more time. Down throughout the centuries, Christians have confessed together on Easter Sunday. Together we say that Jesus Christ is risen, and God's people say? Risen. Oh, no, no, no. You guys are going to... Um, okay, we're going to try this one more time. Are you ready? Jesus Christ is risen. There you go. You've got it. I, right. I think, uh, is Paige going to lead us through a reading right now? There we go. Come on up, Paige. I'll start here with this one. All righty. Good morning. Every month here at Redeemer, we have the opportunity to corporately profess our faith. Today, we will be using the Apostles' Creed. I will read the part that says leader, and we will read the part that says congregation together. You can follow along on the screen. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Did I go a little too fast on that one? <laughs> Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Ooh, maybe not. <laughs> Keep going? Okay. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Good morning and welcome again to Redeemer Baptist. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Theo. Uh, I'm an elder in training, a church council member at large. Um, I get to lead you guys through the prayer of uh, confession, assurance, and illumination. Uh, A little bit about this prayer. The first time I prayed it, I I asked Pastor Chris, I said, is there a better name for this? Uh, The short answer is no. (laughs) The the longer answer is, uh, is that... The, the goal for today is not that we leave service with some new piece of information, um, but rather that we leave transformed more into the image of Christ. Um, not that, that that information is a bad thing, but, but our goal for today is change. We want each person attending today to become a little bit more like Christ, and we know from John 16 that this work requires the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, our sin separates us from uh, the Holy Spirit. We see this sort of repeated uh, throughout Scripture in Genesis 3 and Isaiah 59, to name a couple of places. And so if we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate the message for us that we can be changed, uh, we'll first need to confess our sins corporately or together as a body. Fortunately, we have a God who loved us. 
um, and he loved us enough to send us a sacrifice for our sins, Christ, who's now risen in heaven and who's interceding on our behalf in prayer. That's why we pray before each message, because we have this assurance in Christ. We confess our sin, knowing that the insurance, assurance that we have in Christ for that sin to be forgiven, and we ask the Holy Spirit to, to illuminate those new truths for us and change us in light of those new truths. So with that in mind, let's bow our head and uh, enter into our prayer, time of prayer of confession, assurance, and illumination. Father God, we come together today to praise you. You are good, and in you there is no evil. Your ways are higher than ours. In the midst of our sin, you continue to work the plan of redemption in each of our lives that's been set before the foundation of the earth was laid. You give us hope in your Son who bore our sins on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we've been healed. We were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Try us and know our thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in us, and lead us in the way everlasting. We recognize ourselves as a people unfit for your kingdom. We are like the sexually immoral and the idolaters. We are like thieves, greedy, revilers, gluttons, and swindlers. Though our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. For our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you. Illuminate our hearts and contrast them with yours, Lord. Convict us of sin that's still hidden to us. We ask that you cut deep so that we might be healed. Trim our dead branches so that we might bear fruit for the sake of the gospel. Use your servant, Pastor Chris, to speak with all boldness and clearly declare the mystery of Christ. Let Chris teach patiently and gently that we might be granted repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth and escape from the snare of the devil after having been captured by him to do his will. We ask these things, that the people would be open to hearing the word and that we may repent and be changed. In your son's name, we ask these things. Amen. Alrighty, can I have all of my friends who are seven and under join us at the front, please? We are going to be switching it up a little bit today. We're going to be doing one of my absolute favorite ways to read through the Easter story. It is called Benjamin's Box, and I'm really excited for all of you to join me with it today. You guys ready? Yeah? Okay. Have you guys ever heard of the Easter story? No? Okay. Well, we are going to learn so much today, and I'm super excited to have you guys with me. Okay. You guys ready? Now Miss Jessica is actually going to move her chair up front so that she, everyone can see our eggs. Okay. All righty. Benjamin. Long ago in the faraway land of Palestine, in a bustling city called Jerusalem, there lived a young boy named Benjamin. He loved Jerusalem because God's temple was there. More than that, Benjamin loved God. His grandfather had taught him many things about God when he was just a tiny boy. Benjamin talked to God a lot. He whispered prayers each night at sunset. And in the morning, he always gave thanks for the new day. One bright spring morning, Benjamin sat outside in the sunshine, and in his hands was a wooden box. Hey, Benjamin, called his friend Eli. What's that you've got? It's my treasure box, said Benjamin. My grandfather gave it to me before he died last year, and he said it was very, very special. He said there's a piece of straw in here from a stable where a little baby was born, and that baby would be king. Why would a king be born in a stable with cows and donkeys? Eli laughed and closed the box. I did hear some sort of king is coming today, and his name is Jesus. Want to come to the city gate and watch for him? All right, guys, here we go. Here we get to the box part. Pay attention. Crowds were already lining the street. Some people had cut palm branches from trees and handed them around, and others laid garments on the street like a carpet. Wow, said Benjamin, he must be a king. The two boys squeezed through the throng just as a donkey entered the gate. That's him. Benjamin pointed to the man on the donkey. That's Jesus. 
Hosanna, Hosanna, cried the crowd as they waved their palm branches in the air. Hail to our new king, yelled an old man beside Benjamin. Why does a king ride an ordinary donkey? It means he comes in peace. Jesus has come to set us free. Hail, King Jesus. Benjamin pushed through the crowd following the donkey, and he grabbed just a little tuft of hair that fell off in his hand, and he put that that night in his box. In the next days, Benjamin and Eli went to hear Jesus whenever they could. One day as they waited, Eli whispered, the priests have offered money for someone to betray Jesus. Why, asked Benjamin, what has he done? He only speaks the truth. They should listen to him. The priests are jealous and they want Jesus to stop teaching, said Eli. Someone needs to warn Jesus, Benjamin said. I'm not afraid, I'll go. He will push through the crowd to find one of Jesus' friends and tugged on the man's sleeve. Excuse me, sir, are you with Jesus? I am, said the man. Please, I need to warn him. He's in danger. The priests are offering a bribe of money. We see some coins here. Um, <clears throat> are offering a bribe to betray him. You must tell him. Shh, said the man. I'll take care of this. Don't repeat it. Thank you, kind sir. What's your name? The man said, Judas Iscariot, as he turned away. He gave Benjamin a little bit of coin to not repeat it. The next day, Benjamin was asked to help his aunt get ready for some unexpected guests. They would be coming for dinner, uh, for the Passover dinner. He went right to work carrying water jugs. Did you hear that the guest of honor is Jesus, said the servant girl? Benjamin's eyes opened wide. Imagine, to serve such an important man, he must work hard and do his very, very best. Soon Jesus arrived and the supper began. If Benjamin listened carefully, he could hear some of the words. But what did Jesus mean when he said the wine was like his blood and would be spilled, and the bread was to be broken like his body? It made no sense. And then Jesus said someone would betray him. But Benjamin smiled. He wasn't worried. He knew that Judas would prevent this. After supper, Benjamin found a broken cup, and he saved it to remember the night he served Jesus. There's a broken cup. Later, Jesus and his friends left to pray. Benjamin wanted to pray with them, too, so he followed at a distance, watching as they finally stopped in the garden. Benjamin sat beneath an olive tree, and he broke off a twig. He couldn't hear Jesus, but he knew he was praying. Benjamin prayed, too, and as he prayed, he rubbed the twig between his hands. Before long, though, his eyelids grew heavy, and he fell asleep. Loud yelling startled him awake. He leaped up in the air. Stop! You can't take Jesus away, he cried. He hasn't done anything wrong. Shh, boy, said one of Jesus' friends, holding Benjamin back. What's wrong, demanded Benjamin. Why are they taking him? They want to question him. Benjamin pulled away. Why didn't you stop him? But the man just shook his head and walked away. All of Jesus' friends were gone now. Benjamin saw the smooth twig in his hand. Dear God, please take care of my friend Jesus, he prayed as he walked. And at home, he placed the broken cup and the twig in his box. Benjamin, did you hear the news? Asked Eli in horror. The next morning, they've locked Jesus up. Everyone says that Judas Iscariot got a bunch of money to betray him. Benjamin gasped. He had told Judas about the bribe. Maybe this was his fault. He said goodbye to Eli and wandered through the city. What could he do? He turned all of a sudden to see an angry crowd. Jesus deserved that beating, snarled an old man. The heretic claims to be God's son. He should be stoned, yelled another, shaking a fist. What's going on, asked Benjamin. Did they hurt Jesus? What do you know about this Jesus, demanded the old man. They all turned and stared at Benjamin with angry eyes. Look how angry they look. Really mean. No, nothing, he stammered. His gaze dropped to the ground where he saw a piece, small piece of leather. He picked it up. It was from the whips used by the soldiers, and it was wet with blood. He tucked it in his tunic and slipped away. Why would anyone beat Jesus? Benjamin continued to walk. If only he could make them release Jesus. But what could a small boy do? He heard loud cries as another crowd, crowd gathered at the end of the street. Hail, King of the Jews, yelled a soldier as Benjamin pushed his way past men and women. And there stood Jesus. Benjamin looked into Jesus' eyes as the Romans threw a shabby robe over his beaten back. 
He expected to see hatred, but instead saw only love. Just then, a soldier shoved the crown of thorns onto Jesus' head. A little piece of that, a thorn, fell off onto the ground. Benjamin's eyes filled with tears. Please, God, he prayed over and over. Please make them stop. But when he finally opened his eyes, the crowd had moved on. Jesus was gone. He walked over to the thorn, and he picked it up. He ran home. His parents paused to hear the story, and then sadly shook their heads and returned to their work. Benjamin placed the thorn and the leather strip in his box, and he cried. Benjamin called Eli. Have you heard? Jesus is to be crucified. No, cried Benjamin. He has done nothing to deserve that. Eli frowned. My father says that only the worst criminals are put to death on a cross. Benjamin went inside and sat in a dark corner of his house. He did not want to talk or even to think about this sad news, but in his mind he could still see the evil men hurting Jesus. I must go, he finally said. If this is partly my fault, I can at least be there. I can pray for him. He told his mother he was going to help a friend, and then he climbed the hill and found a large spike. It was like those used by Romans to nail criminals to crosses. He tucked it in his tunic and continued on. Three crosses stood at the top, but he could not force his eyes to look upon his friend. He noticed a small group of people apart from the larger crowd, and he knew they were Jesus' dearest friends. He sat near them and vowed to pray, but the only words that came were, I'm sorry, God. I'm so sorry. Benjamin watched as soldiers gambled for Jesus' clothes. He tried to shut his ears to their cruel remarks. Finally, he forced himself to look up and looked into Jesus' eyes and saw such sorrow and pain that it cut to his heart. But he also saw love. And like before, Jesus looked right at Benjamin. Surely this was his way of saying that all would be well. Perhaps he would even do a miracle. But instead, the sky turned dark, and Jesus cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the ground shook, and Jesus breathed his last breath. Benjamin was stunned. Jesus was actually dead. As if in a dream, Benjamin heard the people move about. He saw a soldier pierce his friend's side with a spear. People hurried to take down crosses and bodies before the Sabbath began. Soon they were gone, and he was alone. He picked up a stone the soldiers had gambled with and looked up at the dark sky. Why had God allowed it? Later that night, he opened his treasure box and placed the nail and the gambling stone inside. He looked at his collection. It had seemed so valuable when he believed Jesus was the king. But now the strange items only filled him with unbearable sadness. Benjamin cried Eli this mo the next morning. Come hear the news. Benjamin stuck his head out the window and rubbed his sleepy eyes. They posted guards at Jesus' tomb. They said that some will say that Jesus will return to life. Benjamin's per ears perked up. My grandfather told me that Jesus brought some people back from the dead. Maybe it will happen again, said Eli, but the soldiers say they're making sure people don't steal the body. Quickly, Benjamin dressed and raced to the tomb. Could it be? Could Jesus have returned to life? How he hoped so. But the huge stone remained in place, and the guards blocked the tomb. As Benjamin walked slowly back down the hill, he noticed a bit of white cloth hanging from a small branch. He plucked it off and rubbed it between his fingers. His parents wove cloth like this for burials. Jesus is dead, he told himself as he continued towards the home. That night, he sadly placed the cloth back in his box. This would surely be the last thing he had to remember his friend by. He tried to pray, but no words came. He wondered if God even listened. Early the next morning, Benjamin went to the market for his mother. He used to enjoy the crowds, but now they only reminded him of how everyone had turned against Jesus. He shuffled along without looking up. It's a miracle, shrieked a girl. Benjamin stopped in his tracks and listened. Jesus has risen from the dead. The stone's been moved. Benjamin turned and ran from the market and up towards the tomb. Could it be true? Could Jesus have risen? In his heart, he believed it could be. It must be. He ran even faster. And sure enough, the stone was rolled away. He fell to his knees and thanked God. When he stood, he picked up a sharp piece of broken rock. It must have crumbled from the huge stone. With a joyful heart, he marched back into town and saw one of Jesus' friends. I know the good news, he said. Jesus is alive. Yes, she smiled. It's as the prophet said. On the third day, he'll rise. Some of us have even seen him. 
Benjamin ran home and told his parents. He placed the stone in the box. What a treasure he had now. During the next few days, Benjamin and Eli listened as the disciples shared about how Jesus had appeared to them in various places. Jesus said that all this came to pass just so forgiveness could be preached to all nations, beginning right here in Jerusalem, explained a disciple. He said that since we saw all those things, now we can go and tell the others about the good news of his forgiveness. Benjamin smiled. Now he understood that Jesus had forgiven him too, and he wanted to share the good news as well. He ran home and got his treasure box and went out into the streets and gathered all of his friends. Inside this box, he explained, is a great treasure. The children drew closer and listened with excitement. One by one, Benjamin took out each item. He explained how he got it and what it all meant. And so you see, he said as he closed the box and looked into their faces, the treasure is really Jesus. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can all be forgiven by God the Father. They all cheered and begged him to tell the story again. Happy Easter, everyone. He is risen. Welcome once again, everyone. I want to invite you, if you brought a Bible with you, to turn it to the Gospel of Luke, to Luke chapter 24. If you didn't bring a Bible, don't worry about it. We'll have the scriptures on the screen. You can follow along with today's message using the paper notes that you can find on the back table back there. Or if you have the YouVersion Bible app, all you have to do is open it up, go to where it says more at the bottom right hand side, and then hit events, and then you will be able to see uh, all of today's message notes, all of the scriptures that we're going to be using as we study God's word together on this Easter Sunday. We're going to be reading an account of what happened after Jesus' resurrection when he encountered two men on a road outside of the city of Jerusalem. So let's begin reading from Luke chapter 24 in verse 13, and we will read through verse 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at a table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? 
And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is God's holy, inerrant, and eternal word. May he add his blessing to its reading and its proclamation. Was it necessary for Jesus to die, be crucified, brutalized, buried in a tomb for three days? Was it necessary for him to be raised from the grave? This is a question that has perplexed people for a long time. Well, the good news is that Scripture actually answers that. And so if you're here and you're a believer, you say, I'm a Christian, I've been a Christian a long time, I just really don't understand why it was necessary for Jesus to die. Or maybe you're an unbeliever or a skeptic, you're not sure what you think about this Jesus guy. I want to invite you to join us as we reflect on four key things that we can see from this account of Jesus meeting with two men on the road. We're going to see that, in fact, it was necessary for Jesus to die, uh, be crucified, be buried, be resurrected, because we have a need for four things. We need the truth. We need truth in a world full of lies and misunderstandings and miscommunications and instability to all truth claims. We need the truth. We all need a Savior. We all need someone to save us from the reality of our sin. We all need hope in a broken world. And we all need to experience the reality of a living God. So that's what we're going to use as our outline today. A necessary truth, a necessary Savior, a necessary hope, and a necessary experience. Let's see how it happens in this passage. We get the idea for this word necessary from Jesus' words himself. He asked the disciples that he had met on this road, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? He's saying, don't you get it? It had to happen this way. Why? Well, let's talk about the idea that we all need to encounter truth. You know, right now in this world, there's a lot of conflicts going on. And if you turn on the news, you'll see people making various truth claims. Various governments and political parties will make claims about each other. And they'll say, that's not the truth. That's fake news. The question is, is the church perpetrating something like a government's propaganda center? Are we perpetrating something that's fake news? Because the argument of the church is that for 2,000 years, we've been telling the world what the truth is, what real news is, and how it is good news. So when Jesus says it was necessary for him to come, uh, to suffer, to die, to come back from the dead, he's making a truth claim. He's making a claim about whether or not he fulfilled his own words, what he said was going to happen, and whether or not he fulfilled God's words. Jesus, in fact, makes that point in this passage in numerous places. But if you keep reading a little bit farther than where we read in verse 44, Jesus says this to his disciples, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Hey, guys, you shouldn't be surprised that I was crucified, suffered, went through all of those things, was buried in a pauper's tomb, a borrowed tomb, and then was raised three days later. You shouldn't be surprised because I told you it was going to happen. These are my words. Over and over again, the gospel writers are eager for you to understand that throughout the ministry and teaching of Jesus, he was telling people exactly what was going to happen to him. And he says, more than that, he goes on to say, this is true, not just because I said it, because everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am everything that God has ever promised this world. When the prophets were saying there would be a new prophet that emerged, a true king, a true savior for Israel, Jesus is saying, they were talking about me. 
when the psalmists were singing songs of praise, Jesus said, those songs of praise were about me. When the law of Moses was being written, it was written to point us to who Jesus is. Jesus makes this incredibly audacious claim. Everything that I said would happen to me has happened, and it happened so that all of God's words could come true. Now, you may want to debate that, you may want to argue it, but no serious historian has ever been able to come up with an answer as to how numerous historians claimed that Jesus himself said these things were going to happen to him. The political leaders were so scared that he might, in fact, actually come back from the dead that they went and secured a Roman guard under penalty of death to seal the tomb. And yet that tomb was empty. How does that happen? It can only happen because Jesus is making a claim about truth. He's saying this is going to happen and then it did happen and it happened because everything God has ever promised you is true. Now I want to ask you, who do you know in this world that can make that kind of truth claim? Who can tell you what's going to happen tomorrow with absolute certainty? Listen, we can't get the weather right, right? You get 20% odds that, hey, it might rain today. I don't know, you know. We can't get the fact that we don't, we don't know what is going to happen to each of us even when we leave this place. We might get a flat tire. We might win a million bucks at the lottery, but we can't predict that with any certainty. And none of us can make claims about the reality of who God is except based on what he has already told us. But Jesus claims to reveal God and be that truth. So Jesus necessarily fulfilled all of his own words and all of the words that the prophets, the psalmists, that Moses had written about him. But when we say there's a need for us to have truth, we don't just mean that there's a need for us to have a fulfillment of what God has promised. We're talking about necessary facts, right? Facts, things you can, in fact, verify. Understand this, the claim of the Christian church is this, that Jesus is not in the grave, that he is risen from the grave. The Roman soldiers sealed the tomb, his body was in there, and then it wasn't because some angel showed up and blew the door open and his body wasn't there. Now, here's a question I have for you. If it was so easy to prove that this was fake, why would a Roman governor with the entire battalion of Roman soldiers at his disposal to prove that this Jew had not risen from the grave? Why didn't he do it? Why, when all of the political establishment and every political party was against him, why didn't they easily prove that Jesus wasn't in the grave? Why didn't they find his body? Why didn't they find a way to prove that what happened didn't happen? The answer is because it did happen and they didn't have an explanation for it. He is not in the tomb. He is risen. And let me just point out to you, if you're a Christian, without the resurrection, your faith, my faith, is empty. It's vain. There's no point to it whatsoever. It is not enough for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins because if he merely died, then he is a near man and not God. The claim of the Christian faith is that Jesus was fully God and fully man. This is not just my argument. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church and he said, if Christ has not been raised, then everything the church is proclaiming, preaching about is in vain. It's empty. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. It has no point whatsoever. And you are, in fact, still in your sins. The power of Jesus to defeat sin and death is hinged upon the reality that he is who he said he was and that God would defeat sin and Satan and death through him and raise him from the grave. And he says everyone who's fallen asleep in Christ, everybody who's already died who believes in Jesus, they all perished. There's, there's nothing to it. 
And he goes on to say, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, if your version of Jesus only makes you a better person for the here and now, he says, we are of all people most to be pitied. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, if the resurrection didn't happen, then stop being a Christian. There's no point to it. There's plenty of moralistic, ethical religions in this world. But if the resurrection happened, if the witnesses were telling the truth, then maybe, maybe it changed everything. Maybe if the witnesses were telling the truth, it is as Bono, the singer from U2, said, this, this day, it's the day that death died. Now, I just want to point out to you that there are numerous witnesses to the reality of Jesus' resurrection. Um, the Apostle Paul listed them for people who were contemporaries. He said, you don't believe us? He said, go, go ask the people who saw him. And then he lists them off. He lists off all the people. Now, let me just point out that, that he doesn't list in this particular listing um, all of the people that saw him. Because here's a crazy thing. The first people who saw Jesus alive were all women. In fact, you remember the two men on the road said, listen, some women went to the tomb and they said the tomb is empty, the guards are gone, they've run away, everything's, we don't know what's happening and nobody believes women. And in that day and time, no one would believe women because they weren't allowed to legally testify in court. And yet it was the women who went out and told the disciples what had actually happened. Then Jesus shows up and he appears to Cephas or Simon Peter. Now we don't have a record that that happened of, of that conversation, but we know from numerous other people that in fact Jesus did appear to Simon. Then he appeared to all 12 of his disciples. He would go on to appear to more than 500 people at one time. And then he would appear to James, his physical brother in this half-brother within this world. Then he would appear to all of the apostles. And last of all, he, Paul says, he appeared to me on the road to Damascus. He says, how do I know Jesus is alive? Go ask James. Go ask Peter. They're still alive. They saw him. Go ask the women. Go ask 500 people who saw him at once. Go ask all these people. He is not in his tomb. We saw him. We ate with him. We talked with him for 40 days. He's alive. Now, I want to ask you, does your faith consist of this necessary truth. And wouldn't it be good to have something in this world that you could be so certain of that you can hinge the rest of your life on that truth? So we see that there's a necessary truth, right? But when Jesus said, was it not necessary, he didn't just mean that there's a necessary truth that each of us has. He meant that there was a necessary Savior involved in that truth. Now, Scripture is very clear. We all need a Savior, every single one of us, right? Uh, I want to encourage you, if, if you're struggling with that, we have our sermons available on uh, YouTube, on Facebook, on our website. Um, we have them uh, recorded, and I would encourage you to listen to last week's message where we talk about what happens and why we all, in fact, are in need of a Savior. But just as a refresher, this is just one passage that reminds us of that. Scripture is very clear. Every one of us is a sinner and has fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I don't know how you argue this particular point. Just turn on your news or examine your own heart. Ask yourself, have you loved God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength every day of your life? Ask yourself, have you loved your neighbor as yourself? Have you ever given in to selfishness, pride, laziness, greed, lust, envy, selfishness that, that turns on other people and condemns them because they're maybe different from you? Look down on them? 
Maybe, maybe not. All of us, though, know that we have individual sins, right? So because we are all sinners, we need someone to deal with that sin. And the goal of the life of Jesus Christ was to live a perfect life that none of us could live. He died as our substitute on the cross. He was raised from the grave in order to redeem us, to buy us back, to ransom us from our own sin, to pay the penalty for our sin, and to establish the kingdom of God on earth. You look in the book of Revelation, so often people want to look and see what's going to happen. Like they read the book of Revelation instead of understanding it's about Jesus. They try to look at it as a book of prophecy, try to figure out is this China, is this Russia, this is America. The answer to that, by the way, is no in all cases. Always no. Because it's not about China or Russia or America. It's about Jesus and his kingdom against the kingdoms of the world. And they're not identified with nation states. But at the opening of the book of Revelation, you see this encounter with the living God, the risen lamb, who has been slain but is now standing alive on the throne of God. That's Jesus. And around him are people singing. This is what they're singing. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. The reality is that Christians argue this, We needed a Savior. Jesus is the Savior that God provided to buy us from our sins to establish his kingdom on earth. In fact, we go farther than that. That through death, Jesus was in the business of destroying something. He was destroying death itself. He was defeating death. He was defeating sin's dominion, its power over all humans at all times. He was defeating the devil, his enemy. So if you read in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, you see there that it says that Jesus himself entered into flesh and blood because we are all flesh and blood. He partook of all the brokenness of this world and yet lived a sinless life. Why? So that through dying, he could destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Jesus died so that we could be free from the fear of death itself. Because we get to know the rest of the story. We get to know he doesn't stay in the tomb. It's his resurrection that completes the story, and it's this resurrection that gives us the hope of eternal life. Pretty much everybody in America has heard some version of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You see the signs held up at the football games. You, people say, well, I believe that. But ask yourself this, how is it possible that I, who deserve nothing but death because of my sin, could come to be in an eternal living relationship with the God of the universe? And the answer is because Jesus has died and all who believe in him are united with him and raised to be with him forever. The way that Paul writes to the Ephesians church explains this. He says that God is rich in his mercy. He doesn't give us what we deserve. But because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, He made us alive together with Christ. Can we earn this? Can we deserve it? No. We get this by God's grace, an undeserved gift of God. So, when Jesus was saying it was necessary for him to suffer and enter into his glory, he meant that we had a necessary truth and that we had a necessary Savior. But he also meant that he was giving us a necessary hope. What was happening in the hearts of those two men as they were leaving Jerusalem, confused and not understanding everything that was going on? Maybe like you and me so often. The world's not going our way. It's broken. Political powers are doing evil things around us. 
and we're not sure what to believe. In these guys' case, they were saying, listen, we've been following this Jesus guy around, and we were convinced that he was a prophet of God. We saw him do these mighty things before God and all the people, but our own leaders betrayed him. They condemned him to death. They crucified him. We saw it happen. And we had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. See, the Jewish people had a hope that a Messiah would come and that he would restore all righteousness. He would take all that was broken in this world and make it right. He would bring people back into right relationship with God. He would restore a broken creation. He would establish a new kingdom and he would make all things new. And they said, we hoped it was him, but now he's dead, and now his body's disappeared, and we can't figure out how that happened, because there's Roman guards on the tomb. And these ladies showed up, and you know, you can't listen to women, but they're all convinced he wasn't there. And then, then you showed up, what? They don't know what to believe. Can we just admit that all of us live in a world without real hope? without real hope. Maybe that's why you're here today, because you came looking for some real hope. You know, the Bible's great at delivering both really bad news and even better good news. We're reminded time and again of who we are apart from God's grace, but who we can be by God's grace. One of the places that we see that is like in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 where we are taught that we were separated from Christ. There was a separation between God and man because of our sins. We were alienated from God's chosen people, the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers to God's promises of goodness. We had no hope, no hope, and were without God. Now that's, that's bad news. But here's some really even better news. Because of the resurrection, we can have real hope, not simply that our sins will be forgiven, not merely that God will ransom us, but that there is a living God who now wants to live in relationship with us, not in some sweet by and by, but in the here and now. And that he is even now taking a broken world and remaking it into his kingdom, what the Bible calls the redemption of of the world. He's in the business of making all things new. Go to Romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 and you see it there. It says there that since we have been justified by faith, we've been justified, that means we've we've had our sins wiped out, we've been made right with the living God, we can have peace. When the Bible talks about peace, it's not merely talking about the absence of worry or anxiety. It certainly means that, but it means absolute wholeness. We can begin to live wholeheartedly and with integrity. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Christians, can I tell you why you should be excited about Easter? Because it's your hope. It's your hope, not merely that your sins are forgiven, but that there is a new world coming. There is a ransomed reality, not only for you, but all of creation has been reconciled to the living God, and he is in the business of remaking everything that has ever been broken and making it into something beautiful. And that includes your broken past, your broken reality. The truth is many of us lack hope in this world because we experience broken relationships, broken jobs, broken health, broken politicians, broken countries, broken realities in our bank accounts and our economic systems. We experience brokenness all around us in every kind of relationship. And the Christian says, I have hope. Because there is a God who is unmaking all that is broken. And he is taking everything that has been broken 
And he is making it into something beautiful in his time. You know who said that he was making all things new? The risen Jesus. It's one of the last things you can read that he speaks personally in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, he says this, Behold, I am making all things new. That is the Christian hope. And he goes on to say, listen, you can write it down. This is a trustworthy and true statement. No matter how dark the world gets, you can have hope because there is a God who is never going to let evil stand. Darkness will be pushed back. All that is broken will be made whole, all for his glory and by his grace. And because of the resurrection, we not only have a hope for creation, we have a hope for ourselves eternally. That we can have resurrection bodies. We can have life forevermore. At the funeral of Winston Churchill, taps was played at the moment when the service was being concluded. Of course, he had military honors, and you know, you, you play taps for these people you're trying to honor, and they're, they're playing taps over his, over his uh, casket there in this great cathedral, and taps fades away in this vast cathedral. And everybody's left silent. Is the service over? Is it done? Have they stopped the funeral service? Because nobody says anything. And then, high up in the balcony, way at the back of the cathedral, after moments of silence, another note was played. And a trumpeter was playing high up in the cathedral, and he began to play Reveille, the command for forces to awaken and begin their day. Why? Because the Christian faith argument is that death is not final. That we will hear the sound of a trumpet and it won't be the trumpet of a mere cathedral soldier playing a horn. It will be the trumpet of God Almighty calling to awaken the dead. And we will be raised to be with our God forever in new bodies his. The resurrection hope isn't just merely an undoing of all that is broken in creation. It's the restoration of Eden itself with new bodies and a new heaven and a new earth. Or as Paul put it to the Corinthians right after he argued that if the resurrection wasn't true you might as well give up. He said but because it is true let me tell you a mystery, he said. Let me tell you something exciting. He doesn't mean something you can't figure out. He means something that's so amazing, so shocking, you should be looking at it going, I'm not sure I can believe that that is true. He says, let me tell you something mysterious. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound. The trumpet will sound. And the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death will die. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to ask you this. Is this your experience? Have you encountered this necessary truth, this necessary Savior, this necessary hope? See, Lots of people believe the facts of what I've just said. It is quite possible, by the way, to believe everything that is written in the Bible is true and for it to have no bearing whatsoever on your reality. Demons believe the truth of Scripture. The devil himself is a master theologian. The argument of Christianity is this. 
It is not sufficient for you to know the truth. The question is whether or not it's changed you. Whether or not the truth has engaged you, transformed your reality. Jesus' death and resurrection are necessary for us because each of us has an innate spiritual condition. We are, in fact, spiritually blind. We are foolish, given to trying to follow our own wisdom ever since the garden when we doubted God. We're unbelieving in the truth that he has stated. Like these two men on the road who are encountering Jesus, our eyes are kept from recognizing the reality of who he is. Each of us can be foolish and slow of heart to believe all that has been spoken. Across this nation and around the world, people are hearing this same truth in churches across this land. But how many people will not know the reality of walking with Jesus? So I want to ask you again about your experience of these truths. Can I present to you some good news? That the Jesus who is not in the tomb... The resurrected Jesus is present with his church. And he is in the business of revealing himself just like he did on that road to Emmaus 2,000 years ago. He comes alongside people. He wants you to understand that his presence is there amongst his people. They were walking and talking and discussing what was happening. Jesus draws near when God's people begin to talk about and engage and build relationships about him. It's why we believe in a gospel-centered community. The good news of Jesus is found amongst the people of God who are talking about the reality of what he is doing. And Jesus doesn't just reveal himself through his presence in some absent form. He reveals himself through his word. We can go to his words. We can read what he taught. We can understand who he is. And then we can understand, as he was teaching the disciples that day, that everything in Scripture is about him. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interprets the Scripture in, in the Scripture the things concerning himself. He opens minds to understand Scripture. Now, maybe that's happening to you right now. Maybe it's happened to you before. Maybe it's been a long time since you sat down and really listened to the words of Jesus Christ and asked him to open your heart and your understanding. He doesn't just speak, though, through his presence and through his word. He comes to us at his table in just a few minutes. If you're a believer in Jesus, we're going to invite you to partake of his table. You know, Jesus revealed himself to those two men by sitting down with them and doing something so ordinary and so extraordinary. He broke bread. He prayed over it. And when he did it, something happened. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Were they there in the room with the twelve? We, it's likely the Passover feast was greater than just the 12 disciples in that room that night. Or had they just merely heard from the 12 about Jesus breaking bread and passing amongst his disciples and passing a cup and saying, there's a new covenant, a new relationship with God in my blood. This body is mine. It's going to be broken for you. Whatever it was, however it was, they understood something happened at the table of the Lord where they apprehended the reality of God's grace. That's why we continue to come to the table 2,000 years later while we await his return. When we come to the Lord's table, we're awakened anew and afresh to the reality of the gospel. But the most critical thing is that the presence of Jesus, his word and his table, need to be used by his spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, to convict us of sin, call us out of darkness, bring us to the comfort and assurance of salvation for all who repent and all who believe in him. Here's what the men said 
that day. Did not our hearts burn? Within us, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures, something miraculous was happening. Peter would go on and explain this to the church and he would say, we've been born again to a living hope. The Holy Spirit does that for all that he is calling to himself. The evidence as of our faith in Jesus and repentance of sin. Can I just wrap this up today by pointing out to you that Jesus is inviting you to encounter and experience him. To come to a grace that is greater than your sin. To come to a Savior who loves you more than you have ever been loved. Who can satisfy you more deeply than you have ever been satisfied. You know, he said to the disciples after he was raised, See me. See my hands, my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And Thomas, of course, did that. Thomas poked his finger into the raised Jesus' side, into his, into his wounds itself. And can I just say to you that you don't have the physical, corporal body, the resurrected body of Jesus in front of you, but you are still being invited to come and encounter him. To honestly... Wrestle with the reality of a risen Savior. He is not calling you to merely believe about Him. He's calling you to believe in Him. To entrust your life to Him. To say, I have no other hope but Him. You know, when Thomas was struggling to believe in the resurrection, like so many of us, Jesus said to him, hey, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answers the only way that he can, seeing a risen God man, he says, my Lord and my God. That's the invitation of Jesus, to let him be your Lord, to let him be your God. Jesus goes on and says this, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. There's great blessing in coming to the risen Savior and say, I have not yet seen your body, but I believe through the power and work of your spirit. And that risen Jesus is in the business of commissioning us to tell the world that he's not in the tomb, he's been raised from the grave. The two guys get up from this encounter with Jesus and they rise that same hour. They run back to Jerusalem in the dark. They find the, the 11 disciples because Judas has gone the way of the damned who knew the truth about Jesus but rejected it. And those who were with them gathered together and here's what they said. The Lord has risen indeed. Indeed, he has. Let's pray. Father God, would you take these words, speak them into our hearts and into our minds. Awaken us to the truth, the power, the majesty of the gospel. Give us a new hope, a new certainty in the truth Give us a new and fresh experience of the resurrection as we come to your table. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord's table now. Here we have simple crackers, simple fruit of the vine, but they are powerful elements meant to remind us of several key truths. First and foremost, we are all sinners in need of a Savior. Secondly, that we've been given that Savior through the work of God in Jesus Christ who died for us, brought us into a new relationship with God, and was raised from the grave so that we might live 
forever. Here at the table, we're reminded of the truths of the gospel, is what I'm saying. These elements teach us who Jesus is. They teach us what he has done. But they also remind us that he has done this not just for us individually, but for all people who believe in him down throughout the ages. This is the Lord's table. And so if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you have entrusted yourself to him, you are invited to come to this table. If you aren't sure what you believe about Jesus, then can I just ask you to have the integrity to not partake of this? It's okay. It's okay to say, I'm not sure where I am, but maybe use this time as we are partaking to ask God to reveal himself. Go ahead, say, God, if you are real, show yourself to me. But don't partake of this if you aren't sure who Jesus is because the scripture admonishes us that if we do this wrongly, we can bring the judgment of God upon us. And if you're a member of the family of God and you've got broken relationships with other members of the family of God, maybe during our time of reflection, you need to confess that to God and commit to reestablishing that right relationship with others because you would not want to partake of his table being angry with your brothers and sisters or having a broken relationship with them. Can I say that also this table reminds us of one more truth that is so important. The table is just a foretaste. It's a snack. It's a reminder of what is coming. But there's a feast that is coming that is so much bigger and better and it's a place where the risen savior himself has said that he will dress himself and he will serve us see we do this until the lord returns we do it looking forward but there will come a day when this shadow this temporary picture will be done away with because there will be a forever feast in the presence of god almighty So we partake in hope of that great feast. Now here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pray. I'm going to bless this. Now there's nothing that's going to happen to the cracker, to the juice. It doesn't transform. It's going to stay ordinary. We're going to distribute it to all who who would like it. And if you you don't think you're sure you want to partake of it today, that's okay. They won't force that upon you. But if you partake of these things, you're saying, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my hope. We're going to invite you, while the elements are being distributed, to spend some time in reflection and contemplation as the worship team leads us through a song. And then after they finish, we will partake of all of these elements together as the body of Christ. Let me pray. (coughs) Heavenly Father, take now this ordinary bread, this ordinary fruit of the vine. Use it, we pray and ask, by your grace and for your glory to bless each of us, to remind us of the truth and the power and the hope of the good news of your son Jesus, whom these elements represent, his blood poured out to wash us clean, his body broken on our behalf, raised from the grave, that we might have the hope of eternal life. Bring us, each of us, to a renewed and transformed faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus of Christ, my Lord. So this is the end of our service. Thank you for joining us. If you are a visitor, um, there's a few announcements to remind you of. Remember, small groups are not meeting tonight. Instead, we have set up this time for intentional fellowship between you and a fellow believer or a fellow unbeliever. Uh, no, you're an unbeliever. Anyways. <coughs> uh, next week, we'll be having our church business meeting following worship. Uh, lunch will be provided. As you prepare to leave this place, hear now this call to service. Jesus said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that he had commanded. And the promise that he says, and remember, I am with you to the end of the age. So I invite you to join me in prayer. Grant us, Lord God, the vision of your kingdom forgiveness and of new life and the stirring of your spirit so that we may share your vision, proclaim your love, and change this world. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Until we meet again, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. This concludes our service. Let's take a few minutes for fellowship before we begin teardown.